housekeeping items, just a reminder to silence your cell phones. Also be sure to take a look at our website to see all the events and classes and trips that we have forthcoming. We've also got these uh, handy new flyers so you can pick one of those up for the month of January. And uh, tonight when we get to the questions, we have a microphone right there. If you could step up to the mic, that would be helpful because we are recording this event. And afterwards, we have books behind the register, and there will be a signing right here. We'll form a line behind that column. And if you could help us out by folding up your chairs, that would be great. Um, so it's a thrill for me to introduce Laura Zygman this evening. She's a writer I've admired since she first published Animal Husbandry some 25 years ago. I think that's maybe right. <laughs> um, and at the time, I knew she lived in D.C., and I'd hoped to meet her, but that never happened until tonight. So I'm very happy that she's here to talk with us about her new novel, Small World, which is just out and getting all sorts of crazy good reviews. It's a novel to do with grief, with family dynamics, and with secrets. The New York Times calls it a graceful swan dive into the question of how a family rearranges itself after the death of a child. And the Washington Post calls it the deepest and most dramatic of Zygmunt's six novels. Those include Separation Anxiety, which I was just reminded uh, was one of the very last events we did before we uh, took a break for COVID. Um, Animal Husbandry, Dating Big Bird, Piece of Work, and Her. She's been a contributor to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, and she lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And she will be in conversation with Matt Clam. Uh, Matt is the author of the novel Who is Rich and the story collection Sam the Cat, and he's also been featured in the New Yorker, Harper's, GQ, New York Times, lots of other places. Um, and he also just published a very good short story in The New Yorker. If you haven't read it yet, it's called The Other Party. It was in December, the issue with Santa Claus on the cover. And uh, you will all appreciate the local setting, I think. So I will now turn it over to our authors. Please help me welcome Laura Zygman and Matt Clown. Hi, Laura. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, so uh, I just um, am going to jump right in here Please, yeah. and talk about the book. Um, and I was looking through my uh, margin comments. On page 174 of your new novel, I wrote in the margins, this is so effing beautiful. It's in the middle of a really lovely scene that flashes back to the narrator's childhood. I won't spoil it for your readers, but it is a kind of surprise that gives so much really needed emotional relief and resolution, which we'll talk more about later. Um, but I want to say that the entire book is a kind of emotional resolution to a family's difficult history. Laura. Yes. I've uh, admired your writing for more than 20 years. I finally had the chance to meet you at my sister's wedding. You and Julie are good friends. We weren't getting married. She was married. <laughs> your sister was marrying somebody else. And, uh, and, and you're doing a Q&A with Julie tomorrow night in New York City. So she texted me earlier this week and wondered whether I was getting ready for the event. I said yes. And then she asked, do you want me to explain any of the hard parts of the book? <laughs> And I said, no, thank you. And then I asked her whether I should refer to you as Ziggy or any other nickname. And then she asked me for my recipe for shrimp and pasta. But then it occurred to me um, that this book, which is about siblings, seems to be a kind of instruction manual for what to do if your sibling is annoying. Would you agree? <laughs> you know, yes, yes. I think if, we, if anyone has siblings, we know the uh, both sides of it. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so in this novel, there's a short prologue, and uh, we quickly learn that Joyce, the narrator, um, grew up with a disabled sister, that their mother finally gave in and put Eleanor in an institution, that Eleanor died a year later, that the mother never forgave herself, that the narrator and her sister, Lydia, who is eight years older, uh, neither of whom are disabled, will feel for the rest of their lives that nothing they do will ever matter as much as this eternal and unfixable problem of their mother's torment and the family's pain. Then it's chapter one, and we jump 
to the present day, and Joyce is minding her own business, living in Cambridge, Mass., divorced, no kids, and her sister Lydia, who's been living in California for the past 30 years, gets divorced and decides to move back to the East Coast into her sister's spare bedroom. So the book begins with these middle-aged sisters together again under the same roof with completely unexplored and problematic uh, an ex uh, a completely unexplored and problematic past that they're still um, studiously avoiding, even though we, your readers, gain access page by page to the complicated forces that shape them. And here's where my writing teacher brain lights up. The author, that's you, is in control. So even though your characters are in the dark or in denial or all closed up and hurt and aching and longing for peace and solitude, you, as the creator of the universe, give us a steady stream of clues about where you're taking us and why. And by the end of this book, you've resolved a great deal of pain and sadness. You give us hope and solace and something sorely needed by these people, which is joy. Um, so I wonder if you would read this paragraph on 34. And um, I marked it here, um, maybe um, right after Me Too. Oh, you have it. Yeah, you can oh, read it from I there if you want. Even have sure. to it's a song? Yeah, yeah OK. Me too. I remember how years after that photo when Eleanor was at Fernald, Fernald is an institution outside Boston, and then after she died, we still went to the beach for part of the summer. We raced toward the sand in the morning to see who was already there on big towels and blankets, who'd beat us to the sea glass, the waves, the shovels for tunnel digging and pails for castle building. Louise was always behind us with her scalloped head. Louise was, mom. Louise was always behind us with her scalloped headscarf covering her hair, carrying a full-sized folding chair, a book to read, and peanut butter sandwiches and grapes and a thermos of lemonade for lunch so she didn't have to leave the beach to feed us all before dusk. She was there, but not there, chatting with the other mothers, but not really. Later, she would joke that all they talked about was recipes and sex. I had nothing to add on either topic. I just lost a child, and of course, no one wanted to talk about that. The minute I had my nose in a book, they left me alone. I never read so much in my life. So that's that last part is in italics, and that's from uh, Louise, the mother's voice there. Um, then uh, we learn about Joyce's job. Uh, she digitizes and packages histories of, say, a business or an institution or some event or a family. She makes slideshows, and one of the things Joyce notices is the things people highlight. Families on skis, jumping off cliffs into lakes, smiling as they dangle their feet over the edge of a steep uh, a cliff on a hike. Um, people who unapologetically and proudly lived. They lived, did fun things that were potentially risky, and they never thought twice about the risks ever present in Joyce's mind, and they survived. And then, um, I wonder if you could read this paragraph. So it starts at the bottom, I'm struck. <clears throat> I'm struck by their smugness, how much confidence families like this one has, and how they telegraph to one another and to the outside world that they're untouchable by disaster or death. Privileged, entitled clans of people of means who, for generations, have gone through life like masters of the universe, playing by a whole different set of rules than my family played, with doing insanely, played with doing insanely unsafe things without fear of consequences. Keep reading. Um. And with so little fear that they pose for photos while doing them. When I see something reckless, careless, dangerous, as I do in today's cache of photos, children in a motorboat who aren't wearing life preservers, a toddler playing unattended too close to a swimming pool, or the wide open maw of a clam bake fire pit, or an unleashed dog, a group of skiers and snowboarders holding beer cans before one last black diamond sunset run, I think of Eleanor, how everything we did at home or every trip we took to a beach or a park or a zoo revolved around keeping her and the rest of us safe. It infuriates me. We were touched by adversity through no fault of our own. We were unlucky. But these people who endlessly tempt fate never seem to get punished. Their luck never seems to run out. So uh, one of the things that's not coming across yet, um, but is sort of ever present in your writing and it's uh, present throughout this book is how funny you are and how you take us into um, these uh, potentially, or these really uncomfortable moments. And um, the sisters, for instance, for reasons that are completely understandable, uh, are uh, butting heads. And um, there's a scene later I w would love for you to read, but 
there's starting on like page 48 of a 300 page book there's the this the the feeling of the melting of the iceberg and i remember first reading some of those moments between the sisters where they accept something they've been carrying around for decades and uh they admit fault and they um are willing to uh uh sort of learn and um i thought there's 250 pages book, uh, left of this book. How are you going to keep these people like uh, uh, moving forward? They're already resolving, but there is so much to resolve, and I had no idea. I think I had no idea that you were going to do such like heavy psychological lifting in what has a, a kind of lightness to it. Um, like, there's no questions here. I'm just like talking no. at you. <laughs> I keep going. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so um, so then there's this thing. I'm sort of working my way to the sorry note. So we, we start to get to know uh, uh, Lydia. So Lydia is the sister who comes from California, and we, we just don't know much about her, and we don't know much about the pain these two have been holding on to. And now they're here together, and they're sort of stuck alone in their lives. Their parents are dead. There aren't any children. The exes are gone. And um, they're, they're sort of working out these massive problems and in a very patient and like psychodynamic way you as the author help guide these people who are like sort of blind and bumbling through these really difficult moments um so can, can you tell us what the sorry notes are and then uh i have a, a piece here that uh, on page 56 maybe you could read from the sorry notes yes yeah, so as you've described, um, Lydia and Joyce grew up. Um, there's they, Joyce is the youngest, and Lydia is the oldest, and Eleanor was the middle. There were two years between them all. And Eleanor was born with um, severe CP and a severe seizure disorder, and she and then she was institutionalized, and she died when she was ten. And so, for she was the center of their mother's universe at home. She lived at home, and their mother made her. Um, you know, was in, she included her in everything and then fought in the early 70s um, for inclusion. And, and to the irony being, of course, that she fought for inclusion at the exclusion of the other two daughters because if you grew up in a house like that, you're going to be, un, you know, understandably so on the sidelines of a, a child that needs so much care. So w after Eleanor died, of course, Louise became much more of an activist even and then just never really forgave herself. But the, the girls grew up um, with this sense that, you know, they were, they were on the fringes of the family. And so, when, and, and Lydia is the one that's a little bit more high strung, a little bit more emotional. So she would have meltdowns, you know, like a normal kid, except if you live in a family like that, you can't really be a normal kid. And there's a whole new thing now, like, it's called well child syndrome, I guess, and these terms weren't around when I was growing up. And um, but it's like well child syndrome is like you're supposed to be the perfect child. You're supposed to sort of be helpful to the family and all that. And so, you know, Lydia is just a kid, and every now and then she'd get upset about something that didn't seem fair, and she would throw a little fit, and then she would be punished for being, you know, emotional, and then she would write sorry notes. So every time she would have a little meltdown, which was probably all the time, you know, she would write these notes and apologizing and, um, you know. And then the, after the mom dies and uh, Joyce, the narrator, is left to basically clean up everything and she comes across this cachet of notes and she hangs on to them and when she shows them to Lydia in what I'm wondering, like, how are you going to pull this off? Like, what's going to happen here? And Lydia says exactly what I'm thinking. She's like, why did you show these to me? You showed these to me to make me feel bad. This is in the middle of this conversation. Um, so, like, I, you, I stop wherever, but it starts there. It's, it's Lydia talking about the notes, I think. I mean, I, la I laugh too, but it's incredibly sad. There are so many of them. This is Lydia talking. She opens a few more, looks at the front and back of them at the envelopes, then puts everything down on her drawing table. What kid writes these, this many apology notes? What six or seven or eight year old feels this responsible for their entire burden of their family's unhappiness at such a young age and never gets talked out of it? I shake my head. 
No one ever told Lydia that it wasn't her fault, that she wasn't the one who ruined everything, that sometimes life is cruel, that terrible things happen to families, that Eleanor's condition wasn't anyone's fault, especially hers. It never occurred to Lenny and Louise that the notes needed to be addressed. Eleanor affected the two of us too. Their loss was our loss, but in a different way. They lost a child, but we lost a sister. And, and who they would have been as parents had Eleanor not needed so much care, and had she not died. They didn't seem to understand that we were there too. They never really said anything to you about the notes. Like, did they ever come into my room after reading one to check on me and try to make me feel better? As soon as the words were out of her mouth, were out of her mouth, I realized how stupid my question was. That's great. So then there's this, I mean, I'm coming to this uh, understanding of how a family is affected. And it's, they, they go to a, this is a flashback to their childhood. They go to an amusement park. It goes badly for a lot of reasons. It's too hot. Eleanor is uncomfortable. And Lydia's like, where's our fun? You know, and she throws a tantrum and explodes. And I just thought it was a great, I kept thinking, I had a friend who married a woman who was an Olympic rower and she looked like an Amazon. And she had a brother who was in a wheelchair. And I remember her explaining to me at some point, like, you kind of had to do a little extra to get noticed around there. And I kept thinking about that in these scenes. They're just so psychologically apt about the dynamics that go on inside a family. So, so it's not just the parents or the family at large, but it's, you know, so clearly, like, each individual member picks up these or has these uh, uh, interesting kind of like dis uh, destructive things that happen to them. Um, and then suddenly it makes sense to me why Lydia moved across the country. And it's not just that she is trying to escape the messed up family dynamic, and it's not just because she had stuff that she felt sorry about, but it's because her shame at being unable to fix this family um, or behave in some way that should have been the right way uh, formed her. So the running is part of who she is. And it's just, again, I'm like, how is she going to get these people out of this apartment in Cambridge? Like, I, I just thought you had a really powerful uh, sort of hydraulic pressure pushed against these uh, characters, you know, the forces at work uh, to drive the narrative forward are just extremely strong and clear. So, terrific. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm saving uh, some, a, a topic till we get, uh, have a, a few more ta thoughts about the book. I don't want to go too far because I don't want to spoil the book for people. And then I want to talk to you about where all this um, came from. But so I'm jumping ahead a little here. So Joyce is really nice. She's really nice, and she's like someone you want to spend time with. She's like quiet and gentle and creative and thoughtful, and she's like this sensitive human being. But she's also <laughs> she's also harboring a well of rage. <laughs> also me. <laughs> and uh, and she is sort of more lonely than she can admit. And she seems for a while to have abandoned certain aspects of like living a full life. And there was just this moment where she admits to being um, like having this rage genie pop out of her um, when she gets too angry or something like on page 100. And I thought it was great. But again, it was like another a, a big sort of pressured force pushing against this, the narrative all around page 100. So around page 100, a lot of shit's happening. And I'm thinking like, how are we going to get move forward? And then something else happens on page 100. I'm not sure how much you want to say about this, but it is um, uh, like a new narrative problem that you introduce. I'm not going to – I'll just shut up unless you want to talk about it or I'm not sure how you want to talk about it, but something happens in the building there. Yeah, so they live in, in a house. They rent an apartment in a house. And it had been a big house at one point. A big house. And so, you know, it's divided into four apartments in Cambridge. And um, all of a sudden, there's all this noise upstairs. You know, it's like a new people move in, and there's just this sustained amount of weird noise. They can't quite figure it out. And, <laughs> I mean, it's not that big of a secret. I mean, so the people upstairs have just moved in, and they've opened a yoga studio above their heads. It's a house. You know, there's no commercial... Uh, enterprise on the street. It's not like there are lawyers hanging out a shingle here and a shrink down. No. All houses, all residential, suddenly yoga studio. And it's you not like steel girders recognize in the floor. Recognize a little rage in <laughs> my... No, no. Because this happened to us. It, people moved in and all of a sudden we were like, wow, what is that? What's the noise? And Joyce and Lydia 
are living together, and suddenly there's like all this mysterious sounds and noise, and they can't. They think dinner parties, a book club. How many book clubs can you have every <laughs> night? You know, um, in the afternoons, it's not. You know, and they finally understand what's going on when they're invited upstairs for tea. They see there's a full-fledged <laughs> yoga studio above their heads. And I love how you, you said there's like there's chains bolted to the there walls. There were chains. This really happened. There were <laughs> chains and ropes on the walls, and we were like, "Are you?" Kidding? <laughs> we, we're downstairs watching Rachel Maddow, and right. like now we're like, what is? It's against the law. It's illegal. Nobody cares. But so I thought it was a great, you know, that's kind of how the novel started was with this situation of what happens when, you know, when you have bad neighbors. I thought that was kind of going to be the the novel, and I thought it would be a couple downstairs. But I had just written separation anxiety, and I didn't want to write about a couple again, and so I wrote. I thought, what about sisters? And then I thought, how perfect, because having a sister who moved away and all that, what would happen if she moved in? And I knew exactly what, what would happen. So there's two things I want to talk about. One is the, the interesting dynamic you create there. So the dynamic you create there is that the two of them are sitting there, and they're like, this is really fucking loud. And then they, they go up, and they, they meet the people, or they already know. And they're like, oh, but it's wellness. You know, like we should be nice about this. And Lydia is more like we should be nice about this. And Joyce is more like I work here all day and it's it's too loud. And they they kind of come to this realization together. Oh, this was our childhood. We lived in a place that was supposed to be a home for us. Instead, what we were was secondary. And what was happening in the house was first the taking care of our severely disabled sister who was constantly in danger of dying if she slipped in the tub or whatever it was, just all kinds of stuff like that. This is not like a homey environment. And then it's the mom turning the place into a, so, some, a, a place of political advocacy. And they, again, are sort of like, where do we get dinner if this meeting's going on? And I thought the way you made that echo and just resonate was just like deft, really. Thank you. Yeah, great. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say, though, which is so funny, so the title of the book is Small World, and the, 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 the neighborhood website, like our AU Park listserv, is, is called Small World, and it serves the neighborhood. And uh, the narrator, Joyce, is a sort of purveyor of fine prose on the uh, website, and she's constantly pulling out and then reformatting things people say and turning them into kind of poems. She, so she does the line breaks, and I should have... Uh, I'd love it if you read some of them. They're so funny, and they go throughout the book. And it's, she's just like, I got to stop here for a second. The author is like, I got to stop here for a second and put some of these crazy poems in. And so let me see if I can find one, because they're, well, there's, <laughs> there's this one. <laughs> so um, do you want to read Stolen Avocados, that yeah, little chain? Yeah, that, that's actually. OK, so that, and it ends right here? Yeah. OK. So this is a multi, if you've ever been on Next Door, you know, type of, type of thing. There are the just single posts that, um, or there's the multi-thread and the responses and responses to the angry responses to the angry response. Okay, so the first one is stolen avocados. A bag of avocados from the local farmer's market was stolen from our front porch where we'd left them to ripen. This felt like a violation, even though, of course, a minor one compared to true suffering in the world. <laughs> this takes place in Cambridge, Mass. Maybe Amazon delivery person took the bag, or a neighbor, or a passerby. I hate being suspicious of people on the street walking past our house, feeling like everyone and every, anyone and everyone is, is a potential thief. A loss of trust like this is so disappointing, much worse than the loss of the actual avocados ex it, themselves, especially since they were probably still unripe. <laughs> the response, alternate true crime theory. Maybe it was raccoons or squirrels. Next response, little pause. Not to creep you out or anything, but it was probably rats, or maybe even bats, not squirrels, as the previous commenter said, or people, as you suspect, that stole and ate your stupid avocados <laughs> with their little rat or bat paws. Good for them. They're sparing the world of more avocado toast made by people who think everyone around them is a criminal. <laughs> Dog poop. I would just like to say that when dog walkers allow their pets to pee and poop in my yard, they're killing my plants and flowers. Poop is an irritant, but pee is what regularly kills my flowers and plants. <laughs> People should not allow their dogs to use the neighbor's yards as a toilet. 
Next response. Dude, wrong thread. <laughs> That's great. Uh, you really put on your poetry beret for those. It I could love have been that. better. These were supposed to be posts that were turned into poetry. I could have written better poems. No, they're great, and yeah. they feel very natural <laughs> and uh, very familiar, too. I mean, it's like Twitter in our whole fucking lives now. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, I also uh, just want to uh, mention that there are all these hilarious moments where you take difficult issues like Lydia's intractable unlikability or Aaron's body image issues. And uh, like I find myself like laughing and feeling so much empathy and it's in the, your dialogue, which is just like really strong, reads like a movie, and um, I'm I I'm not sure what I was after here, but let me just look at page one ten because um, I kind of want to get you to read some dialogue. Uh, so, <laughs> do you do you would you mind reading this scene? So it's yeah. okay. What you want? Was it just after they go upstairs, or is um, so they're invited to go upstairs, and and you know Lydia is really socially awkward. I mean, she's extremely socially awkward, and Joyce is embarrassed all the time because she's so socially awkward that she's always offending people, and it's awkward. <laughs> so they've been invited to go upstairs, and um, and they've been, been invited to come upstairs for tea. And Lydia, of course, has said, but, you know, Joyce doesn't like tea. Okay, so. Um, I can't, so then back in their own apartment. I can't believe you said that thing about the coffee, I whisper yell inside our apartment. We're in the kitchen still holding our bags of groceries while Lydia arranges her pumpkins on the kitchen table. And why did you say that tomorrow works? I was trying to get us out of it. What did you want me to do? Lydia takes a step back to admire her pumpkin arrangement like it's an art installation or a Per, or a seasonal display at Whole Foods. It was so awkward. They could tell there was no thing tomorrow that we said we'd do. And then you lied again about being sober. You've never had a drinking problem. She shrugs. It just came out. I think you have a serious lying problem. I don't. I told you. I get nervous. I drop the bags on the table, hoping to disturb her display a little or a lot. But did you see the paw hand when he licked it, she said? We both, it's, it's in the previous thing. Uh, we both shake our heads and shiver. We are never closer than we are when we're mutually disgusted or horrified by someone disgusting or horrifying. There's definitely something weird about their relationship. Maybe they haven't been together that long. He seems super insecure. Not to mention that she's older than he is. The first time I saw them, I thought she might be his mother or his aunt. She regards her pumpkins, then picks up two of them and pretends they're kissing each other. <laughs> You're so gross, I say. She sticks her tongue out at me. You're so uptight. I take a few things out of the bags, avocados, cheese, Lydia's stupid kale chips that are always crushed when she opens the bag, various square boxes of sad frozen vegetable curries and burritos that we microwave and never finish. They're probably upstairs right now talking about what a weird couple we are. Who cares what they think, Lydia snaps. I do. I care. Why do you give a shit, Joyce? Nobody cares what you... Nobody cares what you do. Nobody even notices. Haven't you figured that out yet? You'd think with the mother we had who barely registered us. You'd get it. Thanks, Oprah. That's great. Um, uh, <laughs> so um, th I'm just going to say one more thing about the book here, and then I want to ask you a couple of making of this. So there's this really beautiful kind of aha moment. I don't know how exactly to talk about it without giving away stuff, but it's where you take the two big strands and you weave them together. And the timelines of past and present, the two sisters, the nature of their childhood, their activist parents, and the exclusion um, – their exclusion from the very important work that was being done while they were children um, and the implication that whatever it is that they're up to is less important than their sister's disability. And you connect it to the present day, which is the two sisters living together after their divorces, encountering these neighbors upstairs. Um, it, I can't, maybe we sort of covered this, but um, it's just that they stand aside and they're supposed to like stand aside and be quiet. And like that's the message that's being s sent from the universe to them, and uh, uh, and the narrator is once again like feeling this like I'm supposed to figure out how to behave with this um, interruption in like the way I think I ought to be living, and um, 
she just has to kind of like fight for air to uh, um, to counteract like the force of these very groovy neighbors upstairs. I love your the 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 kind of axe you're grinding against wellness too. Uh, so anyway, I love that moment, which you're sort of doing well, all you know, right no, there. Annoying noise destroys wellness, but <laughs> right. no, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, so uh, I, I'm not sure uh, uh, how much more I want to say about the, the book, but I think there's a, a good sort of feeling there about, um, like, people can get a sense of it. But um, so you, um, how long had you been thinking about writing about this subject? And no, can you tell us a, where the idea came yeah, from? Yeah, so I had wanted to kind of write about, you know, this is based very loosely on my own family. I had a sister who was born with a really rare bone disease and died when she was seven. So it's very different from the book. The sister doesn't, you know, my sister didn't live with us. She was institutionalized, you know, when she was probably two. And so we grew up in the sort of shadow of my parents' grief because she died when she was seven. And she died in 1965, and so the rest of our family life was kind of a little bit sad um, because they were sad. And you know, when you grow up in a f family like that, I I never really I would go to other friends' houses and I would go um, and see their families, and there was like soccer cleats and skis and jackets and cats and dogs, and they were just always having you know fun. I'm sure they had their own misery, but it just had that their houses were just full of life, you know. And I would come home to ours and it was just a really, really quiet, kind of sad place. I mean, it probably was. And they were just, um, you know, they, they'd had a really hard thing happen, but it had happened off, off stage as it were. And so we didn't know our sister. And I had thought for a while of trying to write this as a memoir and I, and I did, I wrote like 100 pages. And, um, and then I realized I had no, it's not a memoir, I don't have enough story like there's not the kind of narrative arc that a memoir needs because it didn't have you know it was like it just wasn't enough for th for that kind of story but i always wanted to write about it and so when i lit up on the idea of like i don't want to write about a couple i'll make it sisters and i thought oh perfect i can use all the stuff that i had written and change a lot of it i mean for instance you know there's an amusement park scene where they take eleanor in the wheelchair you know we used to go to this amusement park in Massachusetts called Paragon Park. And everyone who grows up has that, whether it's Bethany, B, you know, you, you have your, your childhood place. And even though we didn't take our sister, she was dead by then, but I imagined what that would have been like. And so you draw upon all the real stuff, all the emotional stuff that real is real. And, and that's the fun of fiction is like, I knew when I started this that their story couldn't be the same as mine because it would be so boring, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, it's, but it also brings up a writer problem, which is how do you tell a story that about something that formed you yeah. that isn't your story? Yeah. Well, it is your story, yeah. but it's also not, and you're not even privy to half the shit because they shielded you from yeah. it, exactly. denying you the material yeah. you need, <laughs> right? So that's a writer's yeah. problem, right? <laughs> well, it's also like, like a human thing. Like I, um, you know, I moved back, I, I lived here, so I grew up in, outside Boston, and then I went to New York for 10 years and then I came here. And, um, and then I moved back with my hu husband and son. And we moved back to my hometown, which was like an accident, which of course it wasn't an accident, but I moved to my Newton Mass, you know, one zip code digit away from my actual house that I grew up in. Why, I don't know, I was miserable there, I was miserable there again. I thought I was gonna get the big do-over, I didn't. My parents were exactly the same, they treated me exactly the same, and I was exactly the same, I was so reactive, blah, blah, blah. And so for years and years and years, I had plenty of time, ample, ample opportunity for years to drive over to Fernald, which was this institution at, at one town away where my sister had been. And I was like, nope, not gonna do it. And so for years went by, years went by. Both my parents got sick and died. I refused to ask them any, I don't wanna know. I've been living in the shadow of the, nope. And then like all of a sudden, I met this family and they had a girl named Eleanor. They're, they're, they have two boys and a daughter named Eleanor and she was the center, is the center of their family. She um, has a lot of disabilities and they're a fantastic family. And she said, we take Eleanor swimming at Fernald. And I was like, you do? And they took her swimming in the building where my sister had lived. It was a state of the art medical facility on, on the campus, you know, campus of this institution. 
and it, it had a pool that when it was built was the biggest best pool like I think in the country you could actually bring the wheelchair okay whatever they still went to this pool and so by the time I was like my curiosity was finally activated in 2014 I was like oh I'm gonna I'm gonna and I got in the car and of course guess what they had already the institution had been closing pieces of it but the, it had been absolutely shut down there were you know um, chains and it had been sold to the city for development so I found an entrance and I did drive through I was chased off or whatever but I was so angry at myself I had waited so long that I couldn't go into the building I couldn't see anything I couldn't even drive around because by then it looks like if you google it now it looks like one of those it is abandoned and it's it's awful and sad but what was interesting was when I started to do research for this I wanted to try to find my sister's medical records um, and I sort of had trouble and I didn't understand why like I made a few calls and I sent a few emails nothing couldn't could, nope can't no, no and I ended up tweeting at this guy uh, who writes for the Globe and, and teaches at Harvard um, Kennedy School of Government and I said I'm having trouble and we and we become really good friends and he was explaining to me that the privacy laws are in, in Massachusetts are super strict on you know I had to get a lawyer all this stuff but he ended up connecting me to a guy named Bob Coleman whose brother lived in the same facility, the same building, the same years. And I got to call him and talk to him on the phone and find out like what it was like for them to visit their brother. They had a big family. And so there's a scene in the book where it's really drawn from his experience, which is published elsewhere and he was very open about his. But you know how they would, their mother would go upstairs and they would all wait in the car and they would see her upstairs and she'd bring the brother over to the, you know, like that. I mean, to have, a first-hand account of something that I had been, I'd squandered my opportunity to find out from my parents because I was still the little sliver of rage, the, the Grand Canyon of rage all the years, like I just didn't want to ask because I was, and, and, and so you're left with these big holes in your knowledge of your family that, you know, until I, I don't even know if the files exist and. So all of that emotion plays out between the yeah. sisters in this really beautiful way and uh, and it does a lot of healing, you know. I mean, it's um, so. Should we? Should, does anybody have a question? Um, yeah. So is that why you have? Do you want to use the oh, mic sorry. over there? Because it's re re it's on. Um, it's being um, recorded. Thank you. <laughs> so is that why um, you have? One of the sisters, I haven't read it yet, so I don't know, just based on what he said, but um, as like a family documentarian, because I have a friend who does that. She was like a TV documentarian, and then she left that and started her own business making like family history documentaries yeah. so that things don't get lost, and you have like a forum to ask the question. So like, was that part of it, like your regret that you didn't? That's a really good question, and it's like an unconscious reason why I made her do that for a living, but you know the the writer and the like the real stuff and then the fictionalized when i first started it joyce was going to be a fact checker and i got it so excited because you know those of us who are writers know like the more you can actually research is the, the less you have to actually write so i was like oh i downloaded like five books on fact checking and you know oh funny fact checking stories and anecdotes that i had it wasn't that funny and I realized like it just didn't go anywhere like her job just did not being a fact checker just did and then in my usual procrastination I was listening to various things and watching various things and there was I think it was a this American Life episode where there was a story within a story within a story and one of the little stories in the story was this woman who just loves other people's slideshows like she'll go to a graduation party or a bar mitzvah and she's like, I love them so much. I weep, I don't know these people, I've never met them, I don't know the grandchildren, I don't know the, and I sob, I love them. And I was like, oh my God, that's it. She makes the slideshows. And, and so then I- And she cries, and she cries whenever she time. looks at other strangers' yeah. slideshows. And then it turned, it was like the perfect thing because she, she, she does put these histories together and she is always, feeling like other people have these happy families or other people have these, it's so unfair, you know, they, look at them, they're, they're on a sailboat, you know, if you're a Jew, 
death by every <laughs> sailboat, skiing, sk winter sports, summer sport. You know, you're gonna drown. You're gonna break a leg. You're, so like, why are they? there? Look at them. They're on. They're drinking, and they they're not dead. So it seemed. You know, she's always looking at other families and wanting that, and and also correcting them. You, yeah. Can you tell she, them what she does? Yeah. So she, um, you know, she she does you know the stuff on the the stuff on the Photoshop. And she occasionally will take <clears throat> a little liberty because she's so full of this quiet rage that other people get to have, you know, dangerous fun. And it's not right. And so she'll change, you know, the beer can before the, you know, black diamond run um, into a Coke can. Or she'll put a little fence, like a little fence in front of the pool, <laughs> just a little, so the baby can't. There's a fat, you know, like this corrective kind of thing. Like, and at some point, like, her sister's <laughs> like, are you going to take that out? Yeah, and the boss you finally notices, like, um, <laughs> did you put that in there? You know, um, so she has this, you know, it's, and, it's, and it's, it's a way to just feel like, you know, you're ordering other people's stuff. And, yeah, it's a good question. Anybody else? Uh <laughs> so, um, do you um, feel funny about <laughs> people asking you, like, what parts are real and what parts are invented? And do you have a sort of way to discuss that with readers? You know, it's never really bothered me because... My fiction from my first book on was always based, always started in a place that was really autobiographical, that I was always very upfront about, like, oh yeah, this was, you know, I got dumped. Um, and so I always felt like every phase of life that I wrote about that was started in a, in a really autobiographical place. Does that work? No. Hello. Oh my God, they're both dead. <laughs> they're not, neither of them. It's, we just, uh, we just read. Hello, hello. Oh, they, they look at, oh, it does it work now? Yeah. Um, they every book has started in a really autobiographical, so, and same with this. So I don't. I feel like um, I don't really have a problem with that. And I there's so much fiction that there's so much work that goes hello? into it. Hello. There comes Alan. This is the third microphone. <laughs> I think the third one's the charm. Is this working? Yeah. So I don't. Do you? I mean, because you you draw some from your own. I mean. We, I'll do, I guess, a little bit. Does this work? Yeah. So, you know, it's part experience and it's part imagination. That's the easy answer. Yeah. I think when you're sitting in front of a bunch of people who are fiction writers, they're like, cool. Yeah. When you're sitting in front of a bunch of people who are like lawyers or journalists, they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> and there's a lot of lawyers and journalists in this Here. city. And <laughs> they just can't stop. They, they also ask questions like, so I had this story that was in the New Yorker a couple weeks ago, and a friend of mine liked it so much that he had to call me and figure out which parts were real. And at some point, I was just like, I can't answer any more questions about this. But it, I felt like what he was trying to do was get control, you know? <laughs> like, you moved me with this story. But since it's just the stuff that happened to you and you're just typing it up, um, maybe it's uh, less... Um, difficult for him to process or something. Yes, is there a question? Yes, I have a question for you two. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm sort of obsessed with this notion of safety and, and fear and safety. And, and I remember one time asking my son's karate teacher, who was two years older than him, what are you doing for Christmas break? And he said, I'm going to jump out of a helicopter and snowboard down a mountain. And I was like, we're going to go sledding at Carnegie Hill <laughs> if it snows, if I can handle it, right? Ah. So uh, my question is kind of that, that notion of like when you were listing, when you were reading that one part, a dog off leash, like, <gasps> <gasps> you know, when you have such a highly t uh, sensitized notion of danger, yeah. then how do you fictionalize those people who don't and, and think about those people who live almost recklessly without punishment? And I, I just want you to talk more about that, I guess. Yeah, that's such a great, um, I mean, I remember like, you know, if you grow up like I did in a family that had already lost a child, th they always look at you like, and they actually, I remember my sister, my, my older sister who lives in California, um, 
when I was going back to college, she drove me back one winter break or something. And we were in the driveway, the two of us, and we were packing up the car with my stuff to go back to Amherst or whatever. And my father came out of the house and he gave us each a hug. And I know I didn't make this up. He said in my ear, please don't die. And I remember just being like, like I thought I imagined it because like who would say that to, I think, is this dead now? Who would say that to their kid going back to college? Like, I'm just going back to college. But everything was so fraught like that. Everything was so really fraught. Like if it was in a car with someone who was a really bad driver, which I hate anyway. I hate that. Um, I don't want to die either, you know, in a car. But, but I remember thinking like, oh, God, this would be really bad. Like if something happened to me, it would be really bad for them. <laughs> so, I mean, that, you may, and it's funny, but it is like this burden you carry. Like you, you grow up with a, a really heavy sense that you have to save them from their sadness. And when I have friends who've really, you know, who have lost kids and stuff like that, I always gravitate to the sibling because I know that the burden on the sibling, the child, is so big. Like they're going to go through their life as I did. I remember one of the first thoughts I had, this is so weird, but when I sold animal husbandry, I remember one of the first thoughts I had was like, oh my God. I, they're gonna be so like it was like this thing like I could finally rest I was like oh on a silver platter here you go like because it kind of got a lot of stuff at the time and and it was so exciting and it never really happened that way again but it was fine because it happened once and and it made them really I was like this will this is like I, I did it it which is you know it's so weird that like you think that way but you know other people grow up differently they have other things you know but they don't have a burden of saving their parents um it, it, real or imagined i mean whether they really wanted me to or not probably not i just felt that and so yeah like four more minutes what how yeah. so how let's, I'll, uh, why don't you go ahead and then i'll ask hello um, i have a two-part question yes um the first one is you do have a sister, and were there parts in writing this where you felt kind of a tension about, is this overexposure? How is she going to react? How, is that, how do I navigate that? The second part is, what happened to the yoga studio <laughs> upstairs, and what did you do about it? Those are great. So when I decided I was going to write about sisters, I did tell my sister we had had a, f we had always been, you know, sort of very different close, but she lived away. She moved away right after college and kind of left me with my family, you know. So I kind of, you know, I was the sibling that lived near them. And so when they got sick and, uh, and all that, um, I was the one. And so we, when my mother died, after my mother died, we really did not get along. We had a huge falling out and didn't speak for a couple of years. And it was awful and it was terrible. And we had, by that point that I started this book, we'd had a really fragile piece like we had c come back together you know my son is an only child and I love my niece and nephew and he loves blah 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 so it was very important for me to keep that going and yet I really wanted to write about this and so I just did the thing that like I never used to do which was just be really honest and communicative like a normal person and I was like listen I'm gonna write this thing and I just I'm not I wanted her to know that I wasn't gonna go back to the stuff the stuff about our parents and, and the not, it wasn't fair and you didn't do this and I did that, you know. It was, I said, it's not going to be anything about that. It's going to be, and I didn't even really finish what, it, and she just said, I trust you. And that was like this huge gift that she gave me, which was like, just write, she said, I trust you, just write your book. And so, and then of course, you know, a year and a half later, I wrote my book and I sent it to her. <laughs> I said, it's done, you know. And I sent it, I said, I want you to read it if there's anything you want me to change. And and um, was like crickets. Like um, after about seven days, and my sister is very good. Like she sends the cards and she she calls and her, nothing. And I was like, oh jeez. And so she, um, after about nine days, I think she said, I'm halfway through. And then there were no dots on the phone. And I was like, oh, I you know I hope you don't hate it. And she said, no, I don't hate it. And then there were no dots. And I was like, oh my god. But. You know, we talked, she didn't hate it, she loved it, and she called, she did call like two weeks later, and she said it was really hard to read because it was, it brought up so much. Like once she got over the fact like it's Lydia is not her, it's obviously not her, she's extremely nice and friendly. Um, 
but once she got over that, it was really hard. You know, there was an envelope of sorry notes. And we've had these really great conversations since then, um, which are really, really amazing. It's an, an, an amazing thing to have happen where you can, you know, open up that thing. There's a lot that she doesn't remember. It was just a sad time. Um, and she kind of got more, she got less than I did in a certain way. As far as the yoga people, they finally moved out. Um, th this is what happened. Um, they were friends of the landlords. The landlords live on one side of our building and, and they had installed their friends above us. And we were bitterly complained. I mean, there was no secret that we were unhappy. And, um, and they were, you know, we kept, you know, people would come and then the people who came for classes sort of looked at us like we were in their way. You know, like if we were coming in at the same time, you know, they were there for yoga. Oh, sorry, I just live here, but no problem. But so there was, it, and the noise just, just it, it didn't, didn't stop. They had pri she had private clients during the afternoons. It was just like nonstop. It was pre-COVID. But, and then I remember one day I was sitting on my couch below the yoga studio and I heard a new sound. And I was like, oh boy, it's a new sound. There was a motor. And I was like, I was like a dog. I was like, I know exactly what that is. It's a Peloton. And that's when I completely, it was like a finger in the socket. I, I remember I texted the, uh, you know, and I'm very friendly with my land. They're great people. I said, there's a Peloton above my head. And if she's, I was like, what's to stop her from ordering six and, and having spin classes? Like nothing, you know, nothing is out of line here. And then um, they said they couldn't have a, a bike and then they got really pissed. And I think that was, it was like six months later they left, you know. Now I live upstairs. <laughs> it's great. I'm really quiet. Well, thank you, Laura, very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.